A young man once came to General Booth of the Salvation Army, and he said to him, I don't know what I should do for God, because I've never had a call. And the general who was old at this time, with many years of experience in God's work, looked down at him and said, What? You don't have a call? Young man, you haven't heard the call. You see, all of us have a call. Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You have to have a call to stay at home. You have a call to go. When Jesus said, I want you to go to all nations and disciple them, he gave you a call. He said, as the Father sent me, even so send I you. We are placed wherever we are placed, if we're in the will of God, to be a light, set on a hill, salt and light, being a part of the changing of the world around us by the very light going forth. Therefore, we are missionaries. We are sent. And as we consider that role, it also includes taking the light to the darkest places of the world. As I look at the picture of missions and those who are in the full-time work for God, we call it, I would have to question why 94% of the full-time workers are working among 9% of the world's population. There's something wrong with the statistics that show us 95% of the finances of the world are used up on a very small percentage of the population and those are the redeemed ones. While 5% is used in reaching out to others, and out of that 5%, the, almost all of it is used for reaching the ones that have already been reached or at least heard the gospel and have not received it. And there's not, out of the 100%, there's not even a, a fraction of 1% to reach the ones who have never, ever heard the gospel even once. Some may wonder how can they be a missionary or what is a missionary? It comes from a Latin word. It simply means one sent. And Jesus said, as the Father sent me, even so send I you. Or he said about John the Baptist, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Well, you could put your name in there and there was a man or woman sent from God and include your name and realize that you have been sent of God. You're a missionary. You're God's representative in your home, your office, your work, your school, your play. You are a light in the world representing Christ. That's what a missionary is. Dr. Oswald J. Smith, who went to be with the Lord a number of years ago, used to say, in this question, a powerful statement, is it fair that anyone hears the gospel twice when others have never heard it once? It's a question to ponder. And as such, we need to recognize that the Great Commission, when Jesus said, go, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, means that we're sent of the Lord and we need to find out where he wants us to be so that we can be most effective in sharing the gospel. But we're never going to share the gospel into those areas of the world as long as we retain our rights. Now, the God-given rights, they are good rights. They're God-given. And we express our love back to him by giving him back those good gifts that he's given to us. We're the product 
of many influences upon our lives, of our culture that we were born into, of our nationality, of our race, and if our families were churchgoers, of the very denomination that we became a part of. We also have habits of eating. We have habits of sleeping. Where did all of those start? What's our home like? Every part of us reflects that which was given to us through influences into our lives. And they become our rights. They become our tastes, our desires. And all of that is, is a part of the summary of who we are. If we hang on to our rights, our tastes, all of those things we value within our culture, the rest of the world isn't going to hear about Jesus. You have to leave those things that you love father, mother, houses, lands, nation, denomination, all of the rest. You have to leave your home in order to go into the culture of a person who has never heard about Christ. That means the relinquishing of the rights of food that we like, of sleep as we like it, of, of our denomination, our local church, of our fellowship, of our friends, of our culture, everything that we consider ours. We lay it on the altar in order to obey his command. We have a worker by the name of Bralya, a young lady in her 20s who's one of those mighty warriors for God. She goes into the Amazon jungles leading teams to tribes that have never ever heard the gospel before. One particular tribe, in order to get there, they went two weeks by one of our boats. We have seven river boats there in YWAM along the Amazon Basin. These are double-decker boats, mostly. You can live aboard about 40 people. And uh, as you make your way up one of the tributaries, you realize that you're only on one of the 1,100 tributaries pouring into the Amazon River. It's big down there. It's big. And as you get to the end of where the boat can go, you get onto your canoe. And those, they made their way another week, carrying their canoes around up to 11 waterfalls and then going on and carrying it around another waterfall and going on. And after three weeks, one became so ill with malaria, they had to return to save that team member's life and then do the whole trip again. And finally getting up to that place again, they went for a couple of days walk and got into the area where they had heard through another tribe that there was a tribe living. The anthropologists don't know about it. The government doesn't know about it. But the people of God are seeking out those that have never heard the gospel. And as they were seated in an open area resting in the forest of the Amazon, they looked up and noticed suddenly they were surrounded by tribesmen with poison arrows pointed at them all around them, 360 degrees. That's when you know that you've arrived. You found them. <laughs> or have they found you? What do you do next? Well... <laughs> You've prayed before, but it's a good time to pray again. And as there was a, those moments of tension, what are they going to do? And finally, the relaxation. And then as the team is taken into the tribe and welcomed as a part, as guests to their, their tribe, and they begin to take part in their food, in their life, it's a different world. And there are things that are okay. In fact, even godly in tribal groups like that. But there are things that are ungodly. And that's where you have to begin living out the light even before you've learned the language. And as you begin to walk that narrow pathway, you're being a light into a place where the light has never shone before. What a privilege.
I walked into one of these tribal villages. It was 450 miles interior, 600 kilometers interior in West Africa, right on the edge of Mali in the country of Senegal next to uh, Guinea as well. And in that area, Guinea-Bissau, as right back in the corner of those nations, out from a, a town called Kedugu, which at that time had nothing more than uh, grass roof huts too. And there may have been a couple of houses or so or buildings that did have a tin roof. So it was modern. But out from there, we went by Jeep as far as we could go in the Jeep and then crossed a river on foot and then through the jungle and got to a village called Bantico. They had never ever heard the gospel before, not once. They had never heard of God before, not once. I was the first one to ever share the good news. And just as a young man out of college, why would they listen to me? But I found they did. They called a holiday. The people came in from their, their fields to hear what this person that was strange because I was the first foreigner to ever come into their village, first one from truly a cross-cultural setting. They wanted to see what I looked like and what I said and what I did. And I greeted them African style that takes sometimes up to an hour if you do it properly. Asking all the questions. They ask me the questions. How are my chickens? How are my goats? How's my corn? And so on. How are my wives? <laughs> I didn't even have one wife. And you could get a good wife there for two cows. <laughs> <laughs> but I was single at the time. And if I couldn't afford the two cows, I could get one. Not so good, but I could get a wife for two chickens and a goat. But I had come to share the most important message in all the world, a message they had never heard. And as I shared, I began, just like the Bible does, in the beginning, God. And I told about the God that created the sun. It was hot that day. He created the moon they saw at night, the stars, the trees, the people. I just simply described creation and how the ultimate crowning creation was the human being made in the image of God. I didn't use all of those fancy terms that we would use theologically. I just simply said it as simply as I could so that it would be understood and true to the Word of God. And the old chief, bearded man, white-haired, he would listen very carefully and he'd go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I noticed everybody was watching him. His response was important because they do things as groups. And then when he'd say, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, I knew I hadn't made it clear, so I'd come around another way and say the truth until he said, mm -hmm. <laughs> But I saw the people come to Christ. I saw the results of the Spirit of God giving birth to the gospel into that village. A church was born. Over half of the people were saved. And I saw that in village after village. Seven villages as a young man have churches today because of a kid that went out there and told them a message that is timeless, that is truth. That's what it's about, but how do you get there? You've got to leave something. You've got to give up something. I got malaria. I almost died. I was alone. I, I don't know how long I was in a feverish uh, delirium. I l literally don't know. I was between countries. Nobody knew where I was that knew me. And there in a little African hut that they called a hotel, I just simply was out of my mind. 